Act Two of As You Like It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. As You Like It by William Shakespeare. Act Two. Scene One The Forest of Arden. Enter Duke Senior, Amiens, and two or three lords like foresters. Now, my co mates and brothers in exile, hath not old custom made this life more sweet than that of painted pomp? Are not these woods more free from peril than the envious court? Here feel we but the penalty of Adam, the season's difference, as the icy fang and churlish chiding of the winter's wind, which, when it bites and blows upon my body, even till I shrink with cold, I smile and say, This is no flattery. These are counsellors that feelingly persuade me what I am. Sweet are the uses of adversity, which, like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious duel in his head, and this our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. I would not change it. Happy is your grace, that can translate the stubbornness of fortune into so quiet and so sweet a style. Come, shall we go and kill us venison? And yet it irks me, the poor dappled fools, being native burghers of this desert city, should in their own confines with forked heads have their round haunches gored. Indeed, my lord, the melancholy Jacquees grieves at that, and in that kind swears you do more unsurp than doth your brother that hath banished you. Today my lord of Amiens and myself did steal behind him as he lay along, under an wag whose antique root peeps out, upon the brook that brawls along this wood, to the which place a poor squastered stag, that from the hunter's aim had thain a hurt, did come to languish, and indeed, my lord, the wretched animal heaved forth such groans, that their discharge did stretch his leathern coat, almost to bursting, and the big round tears coast one another down his innocent nose in piteous chase, and thus the fairy fool much marked of the melancholy jaquies stood on the extremest verge of the swift brook, augmenting it with tears. But what said jaquies? Did he not moralize this spectacle? Oh, yes, into a thousand smiles, first for his weeping into the needless stream. Poor dear, quoth he, thou makest a testament, as worldlings do, giving thy sum of more to that which had too much, than being there alone, left and abandoned of his wavelet friends. Tis right, quoth he, thus misery doth part, the flux of company and on a careless herd, full of pasture, jumps along by him, and never stays to greet him. Eh, quoth Jaquir, sweep on, you fat and greasy citizens. Tis just the fashion. Wherefore do you look upon that poor and broken bankrupt there? Thus most invectively he preached through the body of the country, city, court, yea, and of this our life, swearing that we are mere unsurplus tyrants and what's worse, to fright the animals and to kill them up in their resigned and native dwelling place. And did you leave him in this contemplation? We did, my lord, weeping and commenting upon the sobbing deer. Show me the place, I love to cope him in these sullen fits, for then he's full of matter. I will bring you to him straight. Exeunt. Scene two, a room in the palace. Enter Duke Frederick with lords. Can it be possible that no man saw them? It cannot be. Some villains of my court are of consent and sufferance in this. I cannot hear of any that did see her. The ladies, her attendants of her chamber, saw her her bed, and in the morning early they found the bed untrayer of their mistress. My lord, the roinish clown, at whom so oft your grace was wont to laugh, is also missing. Hesperia, the prince's gentlewoman, confesses that she secretly o'erheard your daughter and her cousin much commend the parts and graces of the wrestler that did but lately foil the sinewy Charles, and she believes, wherever they are gone, that youth is surely in their company. Send to his brother, fetch that gallant hither. If he be absent, bring his brother to me. I'll make him find him. Do this suddenly, and let not search and inquisition quail to bring again these foolish runaways. Exeunt. Scene three. Before Oliver's house. Enter Orlando and Adam, meeting. Who's there? 
What, my young master? Oh, my gentle master? Oh, my sweet master, are your memory of old Sir Roland? Why, what make you here? Why are you virtuous? Why do people love you? And wherefore art you gentle, strong, and valiant? Why would you be so fond to overcome the bonny prize of the humorous duke? Your praises come too swiftly home before you. Know you not, master, to some kind of men their graces serve them but as enemies? No more do yours. Your virtues, gentle master, are sanctified and holy traitors to you. Oh, what a world is this, when what is comely envenoms him that bears it. Why, what's the matter? Oh, unhappy youth, come not within these doors, within this roof, the enemy of all your graces lives, your brother. No, not your brother, yet the son, yet not the son. I will not call him son of him I was about to call his father have heard your praises and this night he means to burn the lodging where you used to lie and you within it if he fail at that he will have other means to cut you off i overheard him and his practices this is no place this house is but a butchery abhor it fear it and do not enter why whither adam wouldst thou have me go no matter whither so you do not come here what, wouldst thou have me go and beg my food, or with a base and boisterous sword enforce a thievish living on the common road? This I must do, or know not what to do. Yet this I will not do, do how I can. I rather will subject me to the malice of a diverted blood and bloody brother. But do not so. I have five hundred crowns, the thrifty hire I saved under your father, which I did store to be my foster nurse when service should in my old limbs lie lame an unregarded age in corners thrown take that and he that doth the raisins feed yea providently caters for the sparrow be comfort to my age here is the gold all this i give you let me be your servant though i look old yet i am strong and lusty for in my youth i never did apply hot and rebellious liquors in my blood nor did with unbashful forehead woo the means of weakness and ability Therefore my age is as lusty winter, frosty but kindly. Let me go with you. I'll do the service of a younger man in all your business and necessities. O oh, good old man, how well in thee appears the constant service of the antique world, when service sweat for duty, not for meed. Thou art not for the fashion of these times, where none will sweat but for promotion, and having that do choke their service up even with the having. It is not so with thee, but poor old man, thou prunest a rotten tree, that cannot so much as a blossom yield in lieu of all thy pains and husbandry. But come thy ways, we'll go along together, and ere we have thy youthful wages spent, we'll light upon some settled, low content. Master, go on, and I will follow thee, to the last gasp with truth and loyalty. From seventeen years till now almost fourscore, here lived I, but now live here no more. At seventeen years many their fortune seek, but at four score it is too late a week. Yet fortune cannot recompense me better than to die well and not my master's debtor. Exeunt. Scene four. The Forest of Arden. Enter Rosalind for Ganymede, Celia for Aliena, and Touchstone. Oh, Jupiter, how weary are my spirits! I care not for my spirits, if my legs were not weary. I could find it in my heart to disgrace my man's apparel and cry like a woman. But I must comfort the weaker vessel, as doublet and hose ought to show itself courageous to petticoat. Therefore, courage, good Aliena. I pray you bear with me. I cannot go no further. For my part, I had rather bear with you than bear you. Yet I should bear no cross if I did bear you for I think you have no money in your purse. Well, this is the forest of Arden. Ay, now am I an Arden, the more fool I. When I was at home I was in a better place, but travellers must be content. Ay, be so good, Touchstone. Enter Corin and Silvius. Look you who comes here, a young man in an old and solemn talk. That is the way to make her scorn you still. Oh, Corin! that thou knewst how I do love her. I partly guess, 
for I have loved ere now. No, Corin, being old, thou canst not guess, though in thy youth thou wast as true a lover as ever sighed upon a midnight pillow. But if thy love were ever like to mine, as sure I think did never man love so, how many actions most ridiculous hast thou been drawn to by thy fantasy? Into a thousand that I have forgotten. Oh, thou didst then ne'er love so heartily, if thou rememberest not the slightest folly that ever love did make thee run into. Thou hast not loved. Or if thou hast not sat as I do now, wearying thy hearer in thy mistress' praise, thou hast not loved. Or if thou hast not broke from company abruptly as my passion now makes me, thou hast not loved. Oh, Phoebe! 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 Exit. Alas, poor shepherd! Searching of thy wound I have by hard adventure found mine own. And I mine. I remember, when I was in love I broke my sword upon a stone, and bid him take that for coming a night to James' smile. And I remember the kissing of her batlet, and the cow's dugs that her pretty chopped hands had milked. And I remember the wooing of a peace cod instead of her, from whom I took two cods, and giving her them again, said with weeping tears, Wear these for my sake. We that are true lovers run into strange capers, but as all is mortal in nature, so is all nature in love mortal in folly. Thou speak'st wiser than thou art ware of. Nay, I shall ne'er be ware of mine own wit till I break my shins against it. Jove, Jove, this shepherd's passion is much upon my fashion. And mine, but it grows something stale with me. I pray you, one of you question yond man if he for gold will give us any food. I faint almost to death. Hola, you clown! Peace, fool! He's not thy kinsman. Who calls? You're better, sir. Else they are very wretched. Peace, I say. Good even to you, friend. And to you, gentle sir, and to you all. I prithee, shepherd, if that love or gold can in this desert place by entertainment, bring us where we may rest ourselves and feed. Here's a young maid with travel much oppressed, and faints for succour. Fair sir, I pity her, and wish for her sake more than for mine own. My fortunes were more able to relieve her, but I am shepherd to another man, and do not shear the fleeces that I graze. My master is of churless disposition, and little wrecks do find the way to heaven, by doing deeds of hospitality. Besides, his coat, his flocks, and bounds of feed are now on sale, and at our sheep-coat now. By reason of his absence there is nothing that you will feed on. But what is, come see, and in my voice most welcome shall you be. What is he that shall buy his flock and pasture? That young swain that you saw here but erewhile, that little cares for buying anything. I pray thee, if it stand with honesty, buy thou the cottage, pasture, and the flock, and thou shalt have to pay for it of us. And we will mend thy wages. I like this place, and willingly could waste my time in it. Assuredly, the thing is to be sold. Go with me. If you like upon report the soil, the profit, and this kind of life, I will your very faithful feeder be, and buy it with your gold right suddenly. Exeunt. Scene five. The forest. Enter Amiens, Jaques, and others. Song. Under the greenwood tree, who loves to lie with me and turn his merry note unto the sweet bird's throat? Come hither, come hither, come hither. Here shall he see no enemy but winter and rough weather. More, more, I prithee, more. It will make you melancholy, Monsieur Jaques. I thank it. More, I prithee, more. I can suck melancholy out of a song as a weasel sucks eggs. More, I prithee, more. My voice is ragged. I know I cannot please you. I do not desire you to please me. I do desire you to sing. Come, more. Another stanzo. Call you em stanzos? What you will, Monsieur Jaques. Nay, I care not for their names. They owe me nothing. Will you sing? 
more at your request than to please myself. Well, then, if I ever thank any man, I'll thank you. But that they call compliment is like the encounter of two dog-apes. And when a man thanks me heartily, methinks I have given him a penny, and he renders me the beggarly thanks. Come, sing. And you that will not, hold your tongues. Well, I'll end the song. Sirs, cover the while, the duke will drink under this tree. He hath been all day to look you. And I have been all this day to avoid him. He is too disputable for my company. I think of as many matters as he, but I give heaven thanks and make no boast of them. Come, warble, come. Song. All together here. Who doth ambition shun, and loves to live in the sun, seeking the food he eats, and pleased with what he gets? Come hither, come hither, come hither, here shall he see no enemy, but winter and rough weather. I'll give you a verse to this note that I made yesterday in despite of my invention. And I'll sing it. Thus it goes. If it do come to pass, that any man turn ass, leaving his wealth and ease a stubborn will to please, duc dame, duc dame, duc dame, here shall he see, gross fools as he, and if he will come to me. What's that duke dame? Tis a Greek invocation to call fools into a circle. I'll go sleep if I can. If I cannot, I'll rail against all the first-born of Egypt. And I'll go seek the duke. His banquet is prepared. Exeunt severally. Scene six. The forest. Enter Orlando and Adam. Dear master, I can go no further. Oh, I die for food. Here lie I down, and measure out my grave. Farewell, kind master. Why, how now, Adam? No greater heart in thee? Live a little, comfort a little, cheer thyself a little. If this uncouth forest yield anything savage, I will either be food for it, or bring it for food to thee. Thy conceit is nearer death than thy powers. For my sake, be comfortable. Hold death a while at the arm's end. I will here be with thee presently, and if I bring thee not something to eat, I will give thee leave to die. But if thou diest before I come, thou art a mocker of my labor. <laughs> well said, thou lookst cheerly, and I'll be with thee quickly. Yet thou liest in the bleak air. Come, I will bear thee to some shelter, and thou shalt not die for lack of a dinner if there live anything in this desert. Cheerly, good Adam. Exeunt. Scene seven, the forest. A table set out. Enter Duke Senior, Amiens, and Lords like outlaws. I think he be transformed into a beast, for I can nowhere find him like a man. My lord, he is but even now gone hence. Here was he merry, hearing of a song. If he, compact of jars, grow musical, we shall have shortly discord in the spheres. Go seek him. Tell him I would speak with him. Enter Jaques. He saves my labour by his own approach. Why, how now, monsieur? What a life is this, that your poor friends must woo your company? What, you look merrily? A fool! A fool! I met a fool of the forest! A motley fool, a miserable world! As I do live by food, I met a fool, who laid him down and basked him in the sun, and railed on Lady Fortune in good terms, in good set terms, and yet a motley fool. Good morrow, fool, quoth I. No, sir, quoth he, call me not fool till heaven hath sent me fortune. And then he drew a dial from his poke, and looking on it with lacklustre eye, says very wisely, it is ten o'clock. Thus we may see, quoth he, how the world wags. Tis but an hour ago since it was nine, and after one hour more twill be eleven. And so from hour to hour we ripe and ripe, and then from hour to hour we rot and rot, and thereby hangs a tale. 
When I did hear the motley fool thus moral on the time, my lungs began to crow like chanticleer, that fools should be so deep contemplative, and I did laugh sans intermission an hour by his dial. O oh, noble fool, a worthy fool, motley's the only wear. What fool is this? O oh, worthy fool, one that hath been a courtier and says, if ladies be but young and fair, they have the gift to know it, and in his brain, which is as dry as the remainder biscuit after a voyage, he hath strange places crammed with observation, the which he vents in mangled forms. Oh, that I were a fool! I am ambitious for a motley coat. Thou shalt have one. It is my only suit provided that you weed your better judgments of all opinion that grows rank in them, that I am wise. I must have liberty withal, as large a charter as the wind, to blow on whom I please, for so fools have, and they that are most galled with my folly, they most must laugh. And why, sir, must they so? The why is plain as way to parish church. He that a fool doth very wisely hit, doth very foolishly, although he smart, not to seem senseless of the bob. If not, the wise man's folly is anatomized even by the squandering glances of the fool. Invest me in my motley, give me leave to speak my mind, and I will through and through cleanse the foul body of the infected world, if they will patiently receive my medicine. Fie on thee, I can tell what thou wouldst do. What, for a counter, would I do but good? Most mischievous foul sin in chiding sin, For thou thyself hast been a libertine, As sensual as the brutish sting itself, And all the embossed sores and headed evils That thou with licence of free foot hast caught, Wouldst thou disgorge into the general world? Why, who cries out on pride, that can there and tax any private party? Doth it not flow as hugely as the sea, till that the weary very means do ebb? What woman in the city do I name, when that I say the city-woman bears the cost of princes on unworthy shoulders? Who can come in and say that I mean her, when such a one as she such is her neighbour? Or what is he of basest function, that says his bravery is not of my cost, thinking that I mean him, but therein suits his folly to the metal of my speech? There, then! How, then? What, then? Let me see wherein my tongue hath wronged him. If it do him right, then he hath wronged himself. If he be free, why, then, my taxing like a wild goose flies, unclaimed of any man? But who comes here? Enter Orlando, with his sword drawn. Forbear, and eat no more. Why, I have eaten none yet. Nor shalt not, till necessity be served. Of what kind should this cock come of? Art thou thus boldened, man, by thy distress, or else a rude despiser of good manners, that in civility thou seem'st so empty? You touched my vein at first. The thorny point of bare distress hath ta'en from me the show of smooth civility. Yet am I inland-bred, and know some nurture. But forbear, I say, he dies that touches any of this fruit, till I and my affairs are answered. And you will not be answered with reason, I must die. What would you have? Your gentleness shall force more than your force move us to gentleness. I almost die for food, let me have it. Sit down and feed, and welcome to our table. Speak you so gently? Pardon me, I pray you. I thought that all things had been savage here and therefore put I on the countenance of stern commandment. But whate'er you art, that in this desert inaccessible, under the shade of melancholy boughs, lose and neglect the creeping hours of time, if ever you have looked on better days, if ever been where bells have knolled to church, if ever sat at any good man's feast, if ever from your eyelids wiped a tear, and know what tis to pity and be pitied, let gentleness my strong enforcement be in the which hope I blush and hide my sword. True is it that we have seen better days, and have with holy bell been knolled to church, and sat at good men's feasts, and wiped our eyes of drops that sacred pity hath engendered. 
and therefore sit you down in gentleness, and take upon command what help we have, that to your wanting may be ministered. Then but forbear your food a little while, whiles like a doe I go to find my fawn and give it food. There is an old poor man, who after me hath many a weary step limped in pure love. Till he be first sufficed, oppressed with two weak evils, age and hunger, I will not touch a bit. Go, find him out, and we will nothing waste till you return. I thank ye, and be blessed for your good comfort. Exit. Thou seest we are not all alone unhappy. This wide and universal theatre presents more woeful pageants than the scene wherein we play in. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, and then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like a furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. Then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honour, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly with good cape on lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again towards childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all, that ends this strange eventful history, is second childishness and mere oblivion, sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. Re-enter Orlando with Adam. Welcome. Set down your venerable burden, and let him feed. I thank you most for him. So had you need. I scarce can speak to thank you for myself. Welcome. Fall to. I will not trouble you as yet to question you about your fortunes. Give us some music, and, good cousin, sing. Song Blow, blow, thou winter's wind, thou art not so unkind, thou art not so unkind as man's ingratitude. Thy tooth is not so keen, because thou art not seen, although thy breath be rude, although thy breath be rude. Then hey-ho, sing hey-ho unto the green holly, most friendship is feigning, most loving mere folly. Then hey-ho, the holly, this life is most jolly. Freeze, freeze, thou bitter sky, thou dost not bite so nigh, thou dost not bite so nigh, as benefits forgot, though thou the waters warp, thy sting is not so sharp, as friends remembered not, as friends remembered not. Then hey-ho, sing hey-ho, unto the green holly, most friends Friendship is feigning, most loving mere folly. Then hey ho, the holly, this life is most jolly. If that you were the good Sir Roland's son, as you have whispered faithfully you were, and as mine eye doth his effigies witness, most truly limbed and living in your face, be truly welcome hither. I am the duke that loved your father, the residue of your fortune. Go to my cave and tell me. Good old man, thou art right welcome as thy master is. Support him by the arm. 
Give me your hand, and let me all your fortunes understand. Exeunt. End of Act Two.